Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Maryland <clears throat> Plant Society webinar, Grass Identification for Dummies Like Us, How to Get Started Figuring Out Grasses. I'm Ann DeNovo, and I'll be your host this evening. Our speaker will be Kevin Dodge. He received his BS in biology from Southwest Missouri State University in 1981 and his MS in biology from Michigan Technical University in 1983. He then pursued additional studies in wildlife biology at West Virginia University from 1983 through 1987. Since 1987, he has uh, worked at Garrett College in Western Maryland, where he is the Director of Natural Resources and Wildlife Technology Program. He teaches numerous courses in ecology and natural history, including courses in wildlife biology, dendrology, herbaceous plant identification, plant taxonomy, herpetology, regional songbird identification, ornithology, and general ecology. His courses emphasize field experience and field trips to other parts of the Mid-Atlantic and he has also taught classes at Frostburg State University and West Virginia University. So we're very fortunate to have him. And Kevin, now I'm going to turn it over to you. All right. Thank you very much, Anne. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm speaking to you from the outskirts of the beautiful downtown McHenry, Maryland area on the shores of Deep Creek Lake. And I want to thank Anne and Lynn and um, Liz McDowell for um, uh, putting up with me as we got this prepared today. So um, I'm really excited to, to be able to do this and I thank you all for joining me this evening. So the first thing I wanna do is I wanna show you all something. You see this? You know what it is? It's a ribbon. It's a blue ribbon from the Garrett County Fair. It's the only ribbon I've ever, well, I once got a ribbon for having a really, really big rabbit when I was growing up. But after that, it's the only ribbon I've ever won. And here's how I won it. <clears throat> so as you're going to find out, I started to get into grasses and sedges and rushes some time ago. And I realized how gorgeous, how beautiful, how interesting they are. And I thought to myself, as the county fair was coming up, wouldn't it be something special to make an arrangement of these things and put it, enter it in the fair. And so, I, and I'm no good at this stuff, but I gathered all these grasses and all these different things and I put them in this vase and I proudly walked them in on Saturday before the fair and walked down to the display barn and I took it to the lady and I said, here's my entry. And she looked at me like I was nuts. And she said, what is that? And I said, grasses and, and sedges and stuff. Isn't it great? And she said, what do you want me to do with it? And I said, well, I want to enter it in the fair. And so she said, she had no idea. She said, I don't even have a category for that. We'll put it with the ornamental grasses. I said, oh, no, no, no. These are native. These are gorgeous. These are beautiful. And so she went down to the, uh, the end of the barn and she talked to the, the person that was in charge and they were kind of whispering back and forth to each other, kind of looking at me and then talking and Finally, she came back. She said, well, we're going to have to make a new category. And so I gave them to her. And two or three days later, when the ribbons had been awarded, I went and guess what I won? I won a blue ribbon. I was the only entry in that category, but I won a blue ribbon. And um, I was so proud of this. And so somebody I knew a couple of days later said, hey, yeah, I was down in the display barn and looking at all the stuff. And did you see somebody gave a vase full of a bunch of weeds, a blue ribbon? That was my display because that's the attitude people have about grasses. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you all. So, you know, for most people, grasses are in grass like plants, it's just grass. Grass that grows in fields, it's grass that grows in the woods. Now, I mean, you know, the, the, there are some people that know about grasses. So for instance, farmers, they know about certain kinds of grasses like corn, because it's a grass and wheat, because it's a grass and maybe orchard grass, because it's an important hay crop or timothy. And they know about certain grasses that are weeds like foxtails. But for the rest of normal society, grass is just that 
green stuff in our yard, you know? Or maybe it's that stuff that, um, that unique blend that Bill Murray talked about in the movie Caddyshack. And then there are those weird people, people like us, who are actually interested in knowing what different kinds of plants are. We're kind of weird, we're kind of nerdy, but we want to know this stuff. And we're pretty comfortable identifying things like violets and, and lilies and even asters and goldenrods. Well, maybe not asters and goldenrods, but you know, a lot of stuff anyhow. But when it comes to grasses and grass-like plants, they're just this impenetrable thicket of look-alike green stuff. You know, somebody says, hey, look at that grass. What kind of grass is that? And everybody else goes, I don't know. It's some kind of grass. And we leave it at that because we're just, they're overwhelming. They're confusing. And technical keys are no help because they're full of, well, you know, technical terms that are terms specific to grasses. Things like spikelet and gloom and what is that stuff all about? But the deal is we can do better. But in order to do better in terms of identification of grasses, we need some place to start. We need to find a chink in the armor of grasses. You know, some kind of place we can get a foothold and crawl inside and, and begin to figure things out. We need to find some way to crack the code of grasses so that we can begin to gain some confidence. And once we learn a few grasses, we can gain more confidence and we can begin to learn a few more things. And that's what I wanna share with you all this evening is kind of how I did it and how now I have my students do it and how you too can begin to figure out grasses. But I guess the first thing that we should really figure out is, is grasses are part of this group of things that all kind of look alike. They're grasses and sedges and rushes, right? And so one of the things that we want to know is this very important concept, and that is that sedges have edges and rushes are round and grasses have joints coming up from the ground. That's one of variation on this saying that many people are familiar with. But what in the world does that mean? So here is a delightful little table I've put together just for you that hopefully uh, puts some meaning behind that statement. So sedges, when you look at the stem, you feel the stem, uh, members of the sedge family, their stems are usually at least somewhat three-sided, some very distinctly so. And that is also evidenced by how the leaves are arranged on the stem. So you've got them in kind of three different ranks. If you look down the stem from the top, you can see one coming out at 12 and one coming out at four and one coming out at eight, all the good times to drink Dr. Pepper, right? So you can see that they are three ranked, okay? Now, you, there's some other things you can look at. Um, the stem is typically solid. And if you look at the sheath of the leaf, the part of the leaf that wraps around the stem, there's no split in it, it's closed. And the flowers, they don't really look like flowers and sedges. They're very modified. And many of our sedges grow in wetlands. Some can be found in, in upland areas as well. Now, joint, or rushes are typically round in outline, okay? And their stem is solid. Their leaves come out in two different ranks from the stem. And the thing is, when you look at a rush and you look at the flowers, they, honest to goodness, look like flowers. And I'll show you a picture of what I mean in a minute. Most of our rushes, not all, but most of our rushes grow in wetlands. But then there are the grasses. The stems are usually round or round. Sometimes they're slightly compressed, uh, so they're a little bit flattened, but they're usually round. The stems are hollow in the interior. The leaves come out at two different angles from the stem. When you look at the sheath that wraps around the stem before the leaf flares out, there's a split in it. So we say it has an open sheet. Now the flowers really don't look like flowers. Um, they're very, very modified. And of course you can find grasses just about anywhere from wet to dry habitats. You can find them in forested areas, you can find them in open areas. So let's look at a couple of images that will illustrate what we talked about. So here is a sedge and it's got this triangular stem. As you can see, the leaves come out at three different angles. The flowers don't look like what we think of as flowers. Rushes, a round, solid stem. Angle, uh, leaves come out at two different angles. But when you look closely at the flowers, 
they have sepals and petals, kind of like a lily. The sepals and petals basically look the same. And then grasses, they have this hollow stem that's round. Notice here how the sheath has a split in it. The leaves come out at two different angles and the flowers don't look like flowers, okay? So here we go again, sedges, leaves are different angles, flowers, that doesn't look like a flower, come on. Rushes, round stem, look at the flowers, it honest to goodness has sepals and petals or tepals because they look the same. And then here is a grass, there's the joint, there's the split in the sheath and a flower that doesn't look like a flower, okay? Now the thing is, Grasses, there's all this terminology. You know, like grass people, they gotta have a different word for everything, right? And so they have all the specialized terminology that can be very, very confusing to us. We're actually gonna talk a little bit about this terminology here in a second. But when you look at uh, a book about grass identification, it, it bombards you, it assaults you with all these words that don't seem to make any sense to you. Um, and sometimes different words for Something, you, we use a different word, but they have to have something different. Um, you can see here, there's your node, which is that joint in the stem. And there's the sheath and the leaf blade, but there's ligule, what in the world is that? And then when you get to grass flowers, all this different terminology, my goodness. But you know, we can actually make some sense of grass flowers and grass inflorescences if we just think about it. There is a wonderful book by his first published, what, in the early 1900s, Agnes Chase's first book of grass, or grasses. And I'm gonna show you that and talk about it later on today. And once you get a few grasses under your belt, it's a really helpful book. But basically what she says is, when you look at a, an infler or a spikelet of a grass, it's like a spike of flowers in a normal flowering plant. So let's just think here on the left. We've got this spike of flowers. And underneath the spike, we have a couple of different leaves. And at each point where a flower comes out, there's the flower, and there are a couple of leaves subtending that flower as you go up the stem. Well, really, grasses are the same. At the bottom of a spike of flowers, or what we call a spikelet, we have these two leaves, which we call glooms. Okay, makes you gloomy just thinking about that terminology. And at every place where there's a flower, the flower, the, the, the sexual parts are surrounded by a couple of leaves. The lemma that faces away from the center of the stem and the palea, which is usually closer to the stem. So, it, but really, this is just a spike of flowers, but we call it a spikelet. And each of these flowers is called a floret. So let's look at an example, okay? Here we go. This is a spikelet of flowers. Here are those two leaf-like structures at the base that we call glooms. Each of these things is a flora, and on the outside you have the lemma, and the inside you have the palea, okay? So you can figure it out. Like, so let's look at these guys right here. So here is a spikelet. I've got the two glooms. I've got a flora. Floret, 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 you get the idea. And each of these florets has an outer leaf-like structure called a lemma and an inner leaf-like structure called a palea. And in this case, we've got these bristles, which we know often bristles in botany are referred to as awns, A-W-N. You can see it again here. Here is a spikelet. See the two glooms, and you see the repeated florets going up, up the spikelet, okay? So you can actually make sense of this. But the problem is this stuff, it's, it's so small, you know, and it's hard to see. And the thing is when you're in the field, you only have two hands and one of your hands is trying to hold the grass and manipulate it. It's like you need about 20 fingers to really do that well because the other hand is holding your hand lens and you're squinting to see it's all this tiny little stuff. So you have to, you have to take it back sometimes and look at it under dissecting scope. And we don't all have dissecting scopes at home and we really don't want to do that because we'd rather watch Wheel of Fortune once we get home anyhow. So why, why do that? We'd like to figure these things out in the field, okay? And the other thing is, you just don't really know what it is that you're supposed to be seeing. You know, it's just all small and tiny and you're just not sure what stuff is. 
wouldn't it be nice, as Beach Boys say, if there was something that made life simpler for us? Well, guess what? There is, and there has been since, I think, 1979. And I was very thankful to discover this book, shown here on the left by Lauren Brown, Grasses and Identification Guy. And this book changed my life. Um, and I, and actually, you know, being a goofy um, nerd person, it really did change my life because it gave me hope that I could figure out these grasses because I had actually tried to use the flora of West Virginia, which is what we often use out here, and none of it made any sense. But this book, and what it does, it also helps you figure out sedges and rushes and other rush like or grass-like plants. But what it does is it uses more superficial characteristics, things that kind of make sense in terms of appearance um, to help you break down the grasses into more reasonable subsets that you can figure out, okay? It gives you, it gives you a way to figure things out. And then, you know, anytime you're trying to figure out stuff, you, you're trying to uh, divide and conquer. That's what you're doing. And it, this book allows you to do this. And so I'd heard about this book and I finally got it. And um, I decided to put it to use. One day I went out to this wetland uh, in the greater Biddinger metropolitan area of Garrett County. And I sat down with this book and I figured out a couple of grasses all by myself. I figured out blue joint and I figured out reed canary grass. And it was a miracle. I could actually do this. And then I was able to look in the big book, The Floor of West Virginia. And by golly, I was right. And then once I knew I actually had blue joint, I could read about it in the big book and read the description and see what they were talking about. These, these terms finally made sense. And so that's the beautiful part of this book is it, it gets you in a different way to um, some of these grass species. And then you can really figure out what the more technical guides are trying to say about these grasses. And so I started requiring my students to use this. I teach um, as part of our, we have a two year technical degree that prepares students to go out and be technicians or, or sends them on to um, a four year school like Frostburg or WVU to go on for their bachelor's degree. And so our students take either an herbaceous plant identification course or if they think they're gonna transfer, they take plant taxonomy. And I thought I need to teach them how to, to figure out grasses and I could finally do that. And so I have, over the last 15 or 20 years had rising sophomores who actually know a bunch of grasses. Now they're not all experts on using the big book, but now they have the tools that they can go further if they want. And I always tell them, you're, you've got tools in your toolbox. You've learned stuff that most students uh, at, at your stage of the game have never, have never messed around with. And so um, they hate it at first, but then they come to enjoy it because they can actually figure stuff out. Now, in the last couple of years, I had trouble getting this book, but then lo and behold, this new beautiful book came out, Grasses, Sedges, and Rushes, an Identification Guide by Lauren Brown and Ted Elliman, and it is, it's even better than the original. So I want to talk a little bit about how this book works, and my, my goal isn't to teach you how to use the book, but how to um, use it to jumpstart your ability to figure out grasses for yourself and, and get deeper into grasses. Um, as I said, the book also helps you to figure out um, different groups of sedges um, and, and other grass-like plants. But what I want to do is take um, the grass section of the book, and I want to show you some of the, the, the options that the book gives you. Now, in the book, you have illustrations that help show you what's going on, um, and we're not going to do that. I'm going to actually show you pictures. But what I want to do is show you 25 species or genera that you can find here in Western Maryland. And, and now by Western Maryland, I don't mean Frederick, I'm talking about Garrett and Allegheny County. So these are the, some species that we can find, um, typically find up here. And if you can figure these guys out, that's gonna give you a good start in figuring out a whole lot more because now you can recognize a lot of those things that are being talked about in the keys, okay? So, one option when you look at a grass is that you look at the inflorescence, the collection of flowers in the grass, and there are no branches at all. Everything is connected direct, directly to the stem. And within that option, 
um, you have a group where the inflorescence is cylindrical in shape and it's bristly. So I wanna show you five different things within that group that you can readily recognize. So for instance, we have foxtails in the genus Ceteria, and we're all familiar with foxtails. We've all seen these guys, and there's several different species. A couple that you might recognize is giant foxtail, for instance, and then also yellow foxtail. But do you see how the inflorescence, especially if you look here, is cylindrical and it is bristly in outline. So if you go to the pages of grasses that look like that, then you can thumb through those, use the description, use the illustrations, use the pictures, and you can narrow it down to say, oh my goodness, this is a kind of foxtail. Now I know what a foxtail is. And if you want to, then you can go to that genus in a bigger book. You can use FloraQuest or you can use the Flora of Virginia, um, the plants of Pennsylvania, whatever it is you're going to use, and then you can actually read about them there and see what they're talking about, and you can see the species that occur in your area. Another member of this crowd, um, a cylindrical inflorescence that's bristly, is this gosh awful stuff right here called foxtail barley. And I don't know about you, but I have seen it kind of shining in the sun, all these bristles or ons as I've driven down the road. and um, so it's a very showy thing and it's easy to recognize and um, the book really you know, confirms what this is when you take a close look at it. It's got all these ons and it's got that supposedly in Alaska, um, uh, Aboriginal peoples would put this stuff in the dog food of people they didn't like and this stuff would lodge in the gut of the dogs and kill them, which is a terrible thing. But this is just not very good stuff for livestock and all that, but it's really easy to see. It's really easy to recognize. And once again, we've got this cylindrical inflorescence that's bristly in silhouette. Another group that you can readily recognize using the book and then uh, put in your pipe and smoke are the wild rise in the genus Alimus. And um, there, there are a number of species. A lot of them are in um, usually in kind of mesic woods or I. Uh, along streams, many of them have a bit of a nodding inflorescence, but notice there are no branches in the inflorescence, it's cylindrical and it's bristly. A very distinctive species of grass is this one, and this is bottle brush grass. It's a really cool and uh, looking grass, and it's really easy to recognize and identify. It is basically now considered a species of wild rye in that same genus, but once again, cylindrical inflorescence, no branches, and it's bristly. And then finally, there is this stuff, which is called sweet vernal grass, Anthoxanthum odoratum. And once again, if we look closely at the inflorescence, it is cylindrical, there aren't really apparent branches, and it looks somewhat bristly. But the other really cool thing about this grass is it has a very distinctive odor and a distinctive taste, which is given to it by the compound coumarin. And what I love about um, uh, Lauren Brown's book is that you can use other senses uh, to figure things out. Sometimes you don't get this uh, jumping out at you when you use a technical key, but honestly, don't we use all our senses when we figure things out? And so it really brings to the fore that it's going to have a distinctive smell to it. And when you, when you get to that page as you're searching through your potential options and you smell the grass, you go, Absolutely, that is absolutely what it is. It makes it so easy to recognize. Another group of grasses with no branches in the inflorescence are those that are cylindrical, but not bristly in silhouette. And perhaps the flagship member of this group is one that many of us actually are familiar with, and that is Timothy. This is another forage grass, non-native, that you can find all over the place, and it's instantly recognizable. You've got that tight cylindrical inflorescence and no bristles whatsoever. And then there's another subgroup in the no branch in the inflorescence crowd. And it is those where the inflorescence is flat. So if you, if you look down from on top, it's not round, it's more flattish when you take a look at it. One example is this stuff called 
creeping wild rye, or I usually have heard it called quack grass. And it's a very distinctive grass. You, act, you have no branches, but notice here we've got these individual spikelets, once again, and each of them is arranged, they're arranged in, in two rows of the stem, so you can see that, and each of them is arranged so that the flat surface of that spikelet is against the main stem, if that makes sense to you. And another grass that looks very similar to it, at least you think it does, until you really look at it, is this stuff called perennial wild rye. If you just look at this and look at that, it kind of looks the same. But when you take a closer look here, you will see that each spikelet has the, um, not the flat edge against the stem, but the uh, narrow edge against the stem. So if you take your hands and you imagine you're putting your hands up a pole, um, quack grass has the flat of your hand against the pole, and um, this perennial ryegrass has the edges of your hand up the going up the pole. And they are very, very distinctive once you have a sense of what it is that you need to look for. And you don't have to rely on technical characteristics to recognize these things. But once you know what they are, then you know what they are when you go through the key and you can either say, hey, that's it, or I already know what that is, and what I'm trying to figure out now is not that. So these are all species that have no branches in the inflorescence, and hopefully you all are still awake, okay? So that right there is six, eight, 10 species of grass or groups of grass that you can readily identify. The next category in the book is those that have flower branches that fork from one point at the top of the stem. Now, there are other kinds of things out there that look like that. There are rushes, for instance, that kind of look like that, but once you have narrowed it down that you know you have a grass, there are several groups, including two things that we're pretty familiar with. There is this lovely stuff, crabgrasses in the genus Digitaria. And um, these guys are warm season grasses. They really thrive in the heat of the summer, right in the cracks in, in parking lots. In fact, I take my students to my church parking lot and I, and I have them figure out crabgrass that is literally growing in a crack in the parking lot. That's, how, that's what I do. So here it is growing, but what is distinctive is when you look at the cluster of flowers and notice that all these branches come from basically the same point at the top. I mean, when you look at it really closely, they're not exactly, but they're still pretty much crowded together, like digits of a hand, hence digitaria. This one happens to be smooth crabgrass. Another one that many of us might recognize is this very, very tall grass called big blue stem. Um, this is something that I grew up with in the Midwest that had been tall grass prairie, but you can find it here. It's been planted in places. You can find it interestingly along uh, in stream beds. And it's actually um, right along the Yakagini River, just below the thundering um, part of Swallow Falls, you can actually find big blue stem along the Yakagini River there. So it's a big, tall, robust grass. Um, people where I grew up in Western Missouri, Eastern Kansas called it turkey foot grass. And I think that kind of makes sense to you. But once again, the different uh, branches all come out at the top of the stem. So, these are two readily recognizable grasses that can give you more confidence as you try to figure out additional grasses. Now, the next crowd and all the rest of them are those whose flower branches are arranged vertically up and down the stem. And now we don't have the, the flowers attached directly. You've got branches, okay? You have a pan of them. One category are those whose flower branches are lined tightly along the branch, often on one side of the stem. And this grass that you all know, so that you can get an idea of what that, what it means, what this term means, is our friend, our delightful friend, Japanese stilt grass. And when you look at it carefully, all those flowers, branches are crowded, lined up flat against the stem. Now, of course, we don't need that to recognize Japanese stilt grass because we have these leaves with this distinctive glossy strip 
that is that is lined up almost in the center of the leaf. Um, and so, but you know what Japanese stiltgrass is, probably. And so since you know it, you can look at this inflorescence. You can go, if you choose to, to the big book and really begin to understand what the big book is talking about, about the structure of that grass. And you can compare it to what you have in your hand. You're not trying to figure it out from the beginning. And in fact, one of the things I really want to emphasize to you all is this. One of the very best ways to learn to use a plant key is to take something that you already know. So you already know the destination of your journey, what it's supposed to be. And you go through the key knowing where you're supposed to end up. And so as you go through the key and you get to this confusing junction, this confusing alternative in the key, you know where it is you're supposed to go and then you can maybe finally figure out what they really mean by is it this or is it that? Because if alternative A takes you away from what you have, alternative B takes you to what you have, then you'll understand better what those two alternatives are. That's a really good way to learn to use a key. Another category in the um, vertical branches along the stem group are those that have all the, the branches all along the stem, not just at the top, but starting way, way down the stem and you've got flowers mixed in with the leaves. And there, there are a couple of things that might be recognizable, little blue stem and then also broom sedge. Broom sedge, I'm just jump ahead here for a minute. Right now, broom sedge is very recognized. You see this in kind of poor, sterile fields, um, these kind of tawny, oranges, uh, bunches of grass growing in there. But when you look carefully, you will see all along the stem from top to bottom, there are flowers and flower clusters. And they're arranged all along the stem. You've got branches of flowers, but they are going up and down the stem um, a good ways down the stem to the top. And so that is broom sedge. Another category is you look at the whole inflorescence and it droops. Everything hangs down, or at least most of the branches in that inflorescence hang down, okay? One option is if you have the inflorescence is narrow, it's not open, it's narrow, and the branches of it are short. There is a grass that grows out here very, very commonly with these broad leaves, and you have this long stem sticking up out of them, and everything is droopy. And when you look at it closely, so here you can see it again. When you look at it closely, you have these branches that um, are, um, they all droop, all the branches droop, and each of those branches is pretty short. And this is what they look like up close. And they have this very long bristle or on, and this is uh, long on wood grass or southern long on wood grass, or there's another name called something like, um, something that has husk in it, and I've forgotten the name of it. Um, and this is a very recognizable grass. And once you know what it is, you find where it is in the key, you can, you can understand what the book is talking about when it's leading you to this grass. Very distinctive, very common grass out here on um, the second half of the summer. And it's, it's really easy to recognize. It looks more than, it's more than just a grass. It's long on wood grass. Another category is you have a drooping uh, cluster of branches, but, um, but it's open now. It's not all tight like the long on wood grass, but everything looks very sparse. So you have these long stalks uh, that a lot of, a lot of just bare stalk in the branch. And, um, and then you have these clusters of flowers uh, at the tips. So they're kind of spaced apart. And one of the classic representative of this group is the genus Glyceria, what we call mana grasses. I love these grasses, these are beautiful. We have um, several species in our wetlands up here. There are others downstate, and most of them are lax. That is, all the branches kind of hang out and droop. So they have this very open inflorescence. And notice how branchy it is, how wiry it is, but at the tips, you have these clusters of flowers. So it has this very drooping appearance. And they are, I think, without exception, found in wet soils. Um, very distinctive. And when you see them up close, they have these gorgeous spikelets. 
of with with these multiple floras that just look heavy and they're kind of flattened and you can see these alternating overlapping floras at the tip of each of the branches of the inflorescence they're gorgeous grasses this happens to be foul managrass by Sirius striata but there are multiple other species and then there is this lovely stuff that also occurs in our wetlands. Notice once again, I've got this drooping, everything is kind of drooping in it, but I have these long stretches of very bare stems. And this is called rice cut grass. And, and I will tell you, rice cut grass, um, the genus that it belongs to, Lyrzia, goes into this certain section of every grass key that you encounter. And as you're trying to figure it out, it, it's hard to make sense of what they're talking about until you actually can put a name on something that goes in that section and work backwards. And it, then all of a sudden things begin to make sense. What makes rice cut grass so recognizable? You've got this open, very sparse inflorescence that droops. But what makes it even more recognizable is the joy you feel if you're dumb enough like me to walk through wetlands the second half of the summer wearing shorts because this will rasp the heck out of your legs. This, along with air leaf tear thumb, make wetlands a joy to be in the second half of the summer. And you can see it's just very, very raspy. And here's an interesting thing about this genus. We have um, a couple of species out here, rice cut grass that we find in our wetlands. Um, and when you look at the node, at that joint, there's this fringe of hair, okay? And once you recognize this is a characteristic of this genus of grasses, you may encounter a somewhat similar looking grass growing in uh, moist woodlands. It's called white grass. Um, and it's another member of the genus, Lyrzia. It's not especially raspy, but when you look down at the node, it's got that fringe of hairs once again. And now you've conquered another grass because you have this general look now in, you've got this going around on, on the node and you're in a woodland and you can say, oh, it kind of looks like rice cut grass. I wonder if it's in that same genus. You look in your book, by golly, there's one that grows in more upland habitats and you've just figured out white grass. And you know how to tell it apart from the Japanese stilt grass that it often grows together with. Another group of droopy guys are those that have a denser drooping inflorescence. There's much more overlapping of flowers. It's not near so sparse. And when we get down to that option, we can look at whether the scales of the flowers have bristles at their tips or not. Um, those that do have bristles at the tips, there are a couple of very distinctive genera. There are the bromes and there are the fescues, and they can look quite a bit alike. So here is um, one of our woodland bromes. And we have, we have a lot of non-native bromes and a lot of non-native fescues. And in particular, we have some native bromes that grow in our woodlands that are really, really pretty. And again, very, very droopy, but notice that the flowers are much more crowded and overlapping than they were in the manna grasses. You will see that the structure in some other respects is similar, but they're much more crowded together. When you look carefully at the bromes, um, they usually, they have on, sometimes they're very short, sometimes they're longer, okay? They have these bristles, and you see how you've got these overlapping florets in the spikelet, kind of like what we saw with the managrasses. But when you look carefully at the tip of each of these outer scales of each floret, what we call a lemma, okay? They're a pair of teeth. You have to look closely, but when you see that pair of teeth, you know you have a broom. Now, it's still some work sometimes to differentiate among the, the various bromes, but now you have another genus that you recognize based on this overall look, based on the fact that we've got these bristles at the tips and we've got these teeth. Fescues can look similar. You see, once again, I've got um, more overlapping of the different flower clusters and I've got the same kind of multiple florets per spikelet, and I may have a bristle. Sometimes the bristles are less apparent, sometimes they're more apparent, but when I look closely at the, um, the individual lemmas, those outer scales of each floret, 
they're, I don't have the paired teeth at the tip. Now notice, by the way, how this one, the flower, the, all the, the flower clusters are more tight against the stem and they're more open here. I'm gonna have more to say about that because sometimes the, it's important to know what stage in the life cycle of that grass you are in because the shape can change. And I'll have more to say about that in a minute. So remember we had an open, or we had a, um, a drooping cluster of flowers with a lot of overlapping of flowers and branches, but there are some that have no bristles. And one of the important groups of this are blue grasses in the genus Poa. When you look at them closely, again, I've got that same kind of multiple florets per spikelet, as you can see. I don't have bristles, but here, there, there are a couple of other things that you can look for. You can look for a little tuft of hairs at the base of those florets, or you can look at the leaves. And you can actually feel the tip of the leaf of a member of the genus Poa. And it's not just flat, it curves up kind of like the bow of a boat. And so when you just run your finger up the tip of that leaf, you've got this thing that kind of looks like a brome, kind of looks like a fescue, kind of looks like a man of grass, but it's got this distinctive feature of the leaf. And you can say, oh, that might be one of the bluegrasses. And you have now mastered another important genus of grasses. You can do this. What about if it's not drooping? I've got uh, branches going vertically up the stem, but the branches are upright, they're not drooping. What are my options then? Well, one of the options that you're given is that your inflorescence is roundish and bunchy. That's often how people have been known to describe me. I'm not saying, I'm just saying, you know what I'm saying? That's all I'm saying. So for instance, here is the best example of that, good old orchard grass. And this is the, actually the very first grass I give my students to figure out using their grasses book and they, they go right to it because it's very distinctive, okay? I've got this more open inflorescence, but each, each of those branches terminates in this kind of a bunch of, of um, spikelets and it's very bunchy and often the lowest branch hangs down while the others are more upwardly oriented. This is a super common grass. It's a very important grass out here um, because it's a cool season grass. It's the major hay grass that we have, um, at least here in Garrett County, and it is everywhere. And our students quickly learn to recognize it. It's so distinctive. And all you have to do is, is, is get some help knowing what to look for. And all of a sudden it just pops out of all that green stuff. And it is very, very distinctive. Another option is that your, in, your, your, your branches are grouping, but again, they're open, they're sparse. You've got a high ratio of open branch to uh, flower, if you will. Everything looks wiry and naked with these little flowers or flower-like structures at the tip. And there's several things that fit this option, but a really easy to recognize now pair of genera are the panic grasses in the gen gen genera panicum and dicanthelium. And there are a lot of them. And um, once you get the idea of the structure, you can automatically jump to those two genera. And one of the most distinctive ones that we have out here is this stuff, is, is deer tongue grass. But look at what I'm saying. I don't have a drooping inflorescence, it's more erect, okay? But do you see, it's mostly stem. And just at the tips, you have these almost bead-like um, spikelets. And these guys belong into a very important subset of grasses. And once you know what this is, you can use the key and you understand what they mean when the book talks about going to this area of the grass crowd. So panic grasses have a very distinctive look to them with these almost bead-like spikelets. And in terms of deer tongue grass. It's got these very wide kind of clasping leaves and slightly roughened, very distinctive, very readily recognizable. But this is just one member of a bunch of things <clears throat> in a couple of different genera now. They've been broken into two genera, but you can figure these out. You can at least get to the genus and then you can take it from there. But you already know more than you knew before. What if when you look at the um, inflorescence, it's straight and narrow, and the branches hug the stem. 
a couple of examples of that. One is something known as poverty graphs. And I apologize, this is not the greatest picture, but when you look closely, you actually have branches, your flower clusters are branched, but they still kind of hug the stem, okay? Now here is one that is fully open. So you can see that the, the, the stamens are hanging out. This is just shameful if you ask me to hang your stamens out like this for the whole world to see, just hanging in the wind, hanging in the breeze, but that's what they do. And it's at this point during the, um, during the, the, the season of grasses when they're the most open, okay? But um, you really don't need this to recognize poverty grass because you've got this very distinctive feature. Poverty grass or poverty oat grass grows in kind of sterile, poor pastures. And it's one of a few grasses that have these really, really curly leaves. And I bet you most of you all have seen this. Now all you got to do is look upstairs and see what the grass itself looks like. By the way, you might notice this, these, these hairs at the top of the sheath. That's another useful thing for this genus. But you look at how these two scales at the base of the grass, of, the, of each um, spike, like completely enclose the flowers. That has a very distinctive kind of paired structure that you can, or fork looking structure. And that goes along with these, this grass or these, these, these curly uh, leaves at the base. And you say, hey, I think I know what that is. That's Danthonia spicata. And once you recognize this flower shape, when you're in at least far western Maryland, you may encounter this other wispy grass that has a similar kind of forked look to each um, spikelet. And it's called um, mountain oat grass or a name, a local name in the mountains of, of West Virginia is Allegheny flyback because high in the Alleghenies, um, when people would use a scythe to mow the grass, they would swing the scythe and the, the pressure wave or whatever it was, is of the scythe would flatten the grass before the scythe ever itself got to the grass and it would flatten out and then fly right back up again. But do you see how the um, individual spikelets kind of forked look similar. And so you can begin to say, oh, that kind of looks like that poverty oak grass I saw before. Guess what? Same genus. Okay, there you have it. Another grass that you can find who um, in flower, the inflorescence, all the branches of inflorescence are hug the stem is this very common grass of our wetlands called reed canary grass. And um, this is a big, tall, robust grass that um, I've, I've never understood how much of what we have here in Garrett County is uh, native versus is somewhat invasive, but it's a quite common grass in damp soils. And even without the inflorescence, you can notice these robust leaves whose base kind of almost clasps the stem. So it's pretty distinctive even without the inflorescence. But early in the season, do you see how the branches all hug the stem? Now, but here is a challenge. This is before um, it's fully in flower. Eventually, those inflorescences open up. And do you see, once again, the stamens um, shamelessly hanging out there? And then once pollination has taken place, it's back to hugging the stem again. Okay, so you do need to be aware that the shape of the inflorescence can change over the course of the growing season but this is another very recognizable grass. It belongs in this little unique kind of subset of the grass crowd. And as you're looking through the key and you've got the option of whether or not to go where reed canary grass is or not, now you know one of the few options in that group and you can go, oh, well, it's not that because I already know what reed canary grass is. Finally, we have those grasses whose silhouette is you've got branches in the inflorescence, they're not drooping, and when you look at them from the side, it makes kind of a triangular or diamond or oval shape. And there are a number of grasses that can belong in this crowd. One of the very distinctive grasses that we have in our region that fits this bill and has bristles on the tips of the flower scales is barnyard grass, a very, very common grass. Um, and it's, it's a kind of a unique grass when you actually get down to it, um, but you can just recognize it by its overall form. And once you know what it is and you read about it, 
you can you can actually understand what the book is telling you about that makes it so unique. And then there are those grasses where the flower scales don't have bristles on the tips. They they have branches in the inflorescence. They they're arranged vertically. They don't droop and they don't have bristles on the tips. One member of this crowd that you can readily recognize is this stuff called velvet grass. This is something that we see in um, the spring and early summer up here. It's really a very pretty grass. It's not native, it's very pretty, almost has a purplish cast to it. And you can see I've got this open, erect inflorescence, kind of, kind of um, a, maybe a triangular shape and outline to the entire inflorescence. But what is very distinctive about it is, it's amazingly enough, velvet grass is velvety. It's like somebody actually intended for that to be the case when they named it. So you feel it and it's extremely velvety. It just almost has this halo of velvet when you look at it, even in the sun, you can see it from a distance and you know what it is. Very easily recognized grass. And it's another one that you already know now when you, once you start using the more technical keys because you know what Hulcus lanatus is. And then finally, the other grass that I learned the very first day I used the grass book, I've got this vertically arranged inflorescence with branches and they don't droop and it's more open. And this is called blue joint. Now blue joint, there were a lot of options in this crowd, but what made blue joint distinctive and the book so helped me to figure out right off the bat is at the base here inside the, the, the two glooms, I have all this fuzz. Plus, reading the book, I knew this grass grew in wetlands, and indeed it does. This is what a lot of people up here would call a glade grass. It is, a, it is probably the most common grass that we find in a lot of our open wetlands here in Garrett County. Big expanses of this that go along with um, tussock set and very, very distinctive and important habitat for some, some of our birds up here. But Using the, the, the grass book, um, I, I would have had no clue what this was, but using the grass book, I very quickly figured out what it was and um, checked it out in the big book, and I had more understanding than I would have ever had before, thanks to Lauren Brown's book. So those are 25 uh, species and genera. What I want you to realize is you can figure this stuff out. You can do it. Um, if you use this book to get yourself started, then you, and, and then you can look these things up in the more technical manuals because, you know, we want to, we want to grow in our understanding of things. You can use these big books to confirm that you indeed have figured it out, that what you think you have does occur in your area. So you can use these big books to tell you that, but you can also then go to these bigger, more technical manuals, and you can begin to engage them with more confidence because you know some of these grasses, and now you have fewer things that are unknown to you. The more things you learn, the easier the key is to use. And that's what I tell my students. They start out in dendrology or they start out in herbace with herbaceous plants, and it's all just this big mass of stuff. But as you learn a few, now you can eliminate options because you already know what they are. And if you use this very helpful book to get yourself started, then you, can, um, then you can go deeper, you can go further. You can jump into the flora of Virginia. One of the things that you might find, now this, you can't see this, which was my whole plan. This is all supposed to be a mystery to you. But within the key for the entire grass family, Poaceae, there is one sub key that says grasses, with two or more florets, and now we know what that is, right? We know what a spikelet is, and you have multiple florets in there. And those two leaf-like structures at the base of that spikelet, the two glooms, are relatively short compared to all the florets. So all these things extend beyond the glooms and they're readily visible. And as you go through your options, you have already learned some options already. There's dactylus, which is orchard grass. Well, now you know what that is. There are bromes, and there are mana grasses, and, and some other things, and, and fescues, and blue grasses. And you can begin to recognize this is a distinctive subgroup of grasses based on the structure of the spikelet. And it's not that 
confusing, really. You can actually see this. Remember what the manna grasses look like or those bromes look like. This is the home of all those grasses that kind of look like that. Now, instead of dealing with all the genera, you're dealing with a subset of them, and you have a fighting chance to figure out this unknown grass that you're trying to, to, to identify. You can do it. I will tell you that as you begin to figure out some of these grasses, if you are weird like me and you want to understand more, this little book is great because it helps you now to understand some of the terminology that was so confusing to you before. And what is nice is she often uses as examples many of the grasses or the, the species or genera that we just talked about. And you can then go grab that and look at that and look at what the book is talking about and you can make sense of what she's talking about. And then in turn, you can go and tackle some of these grasses for real. You can do it. There is another very, or very recently published book for our region that is also really, really user-friendly, I think. And it is Sarah Chamberlain's Field Guide to Grasses in the Mid-Atlantic. And, and I know um, Liz has um, interacted with, 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 um, with her for years and, and brought back to me these, um, uh, these pages of paper that she and, and Ron and I have gone through trying to figure out some of these grasses. And now, and, and sedges and rushes, but now, at least for the grasses, this has been published, and it's a really helpful guide. And so, if you start out with um, uh, the, 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 the grass book that we've been talking about, then you can jump to this next, and, um, and it's going to make so much more sense to you. You don't have to start with this book if it's confusing to you. You can get started by using superficial characteristics to figure things out. And then you can gain confidence and you can jump to something more technical. So the deal is, you know, grasses aren't just grasses, as it turns out. They are actually all sorts of different grasses. And they are, as we say in the business, figure outable. Um, it's something that you can do. You just need a way to get started. And using this simple book, you can crack the code and go deeper. And you can begin to appreciate them because you're looking at them more closely and appreciate their beauty. And you can begin to um, say, look at all that stuff out there. It's not just grass because I know there are probably, there are a couple of species of glyceria out there that I can see. And I just found this, this wetland poa out there. And there is this late uh, flowering member of the genus Calamagrostis because I can actually figure this stuff out. I am a dummy, but I'm no longer a dummy when it comes to grasses. And the world just becomes even more cool because you can open the veil now and figure this stuff out that you were never able to figure out before. And you can do it. And it's cool and it's fun and you can become a genius. So that is it for my presentation. And um, I would just encourage you to go straight to bed, no warm milk or cookies because you've already gotten your bedtime story. But if you're still awake and you have any questions, I would be more than happy to answer them. And I, I hope this was of help to you and I appreciate your, your time and attention. Well, Kevin- there, Wake up, I, wake up, Ann. Okay. Yes, I'm awake. Okay. Uh, Kevin, there are a number of questions, but before we get to those, I just want to thank Charlie Davis for putting the link for um, Agnes Chase's first book of grasses from 1922 in the chat. And Lynn has shared that out to everyone. Thank so you, Charlie. if you want to access that online, you can cool. copy the link. Uh, I also um, want to say that a number of people have greeted Kevin and given compliments. And I will pass those on, but I'm not going to read them all out loud. But rest assured, I will get those to him. Thank you. OK, Kevin, our first question is possibly a big one. Which of these grasses are native and which are non-native? Um, of the ones that I've talked about? Well, I'm so glad that you asked me that question. Um, there are, you know, obviously there are a lot of non-native grasses. Um, some, some specifically brought in intentionally uh, for use as such as orchard grass and timothy and others that just kind of went along for the ride. So, um, I don't know if you want me to go through the whole list and talk about which is native and which isn't. I think 
Um, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll say this. Uh, for instance, those wild rye, those are native and bottle brush grass is native. Um, a big blue stem is native. Broom sedge is native. The long on wood grass, the mana grasses and cut grass uh, are native. We have some of the bromes are native, some of the fescues are native, some of the bluegrasses are native. Um, most, I guess, if not all of the, of the panic grasses are native. The Dansonias are native. Reed canary grass is kind of weird because I'm never quite sure what the deal is because it's often cited to be invasive and um, somebody can certainly enlighten me on that. And then and blue joint is native, for instance. So there's a real mix and you're gonna encounter both native and non-native forms. Um, when you get into some undisturbed territory, um, obviously that's where you're more likely to find the native species. And there's some really rare ones out there. Um, what's really neat is, um, I talked about the managrasses or glyceria. Um, in the very southwest corner of Garrett County in the Kempton area, the headwaters of the North Branch of the Potomac, we actually found a giant uh, managrass, glyceria um, grandis. And that was really exciting because I think it is listed as S1 in the state. Um, so that's cool. So, but you know, for most people, there would just be some kind of grass. So anyhow, so it's a mix of native and non-native. I'm sure that answered what people wanted to hear, but um, yeah, it's a mix. Next question, is broom sedge a grass or a sedge? It's a grass. And, and by the way, this, is a, this brings up a very good point. Um, you know, there are two things I want to say about common names. For instance, I confuse the heck out of my students. There is a species uh, called wool grass, okay? And wool grass is not a grass. It's a type of bulrush in the genus Scirpus, but it's not a rush. It's in the Cyperaceae, which is the sedge family. How confusing is that? So these names can really throw you off. The second thing I want to say about common names is, let's say you figured out a grass using um, the, the, well, the new book now, um, I'm digging it out here, this grasses, sedges, and rushes. I feel like I'm doing a, uh, what is a uh, infomercial? Um, but you use that book, right? And there's, they're gonna use a, a, a common name, but that common name may not be what you're gonna find in another book. You should always use the scientific name when you're looking for a species in another source. Don't look it up using the common name because it may not be the one that that other book or website uses. Always use the scientific name. But in the case of broom sedge, broom sedge is not a grass, it's not a sedge, it's a grass. But isn't that confusing, right? Makes no sense. Okay, do you have any advice about how to identify from photos? The questioner says, I lead citizen science projects and often need to help others identify plants, but all I have to go off of is their pictures as I'm not out in the field with the observer. Right. Well, I think that's, I think that's such a challenge. That's, I'm amazed at what the, I guess what, what's um, like the Maryland Biodiversity Project folks do. They, they farm these images out to, to experts, but I don't know how you are able to figure some stuff out based on a single photo. And you know, with, with grasses, I think photos are particularly problematic because you get a picture of the overall grass, but you have no detail to work with. Um, maybe you need a picture of, you know, very, very up close picture of the inflorescence. Um, but sometimes the important detail even isn't even there. It's gonna be something on the stem or something about the leaf. Um, so I don't know what to say. I know I, one of the really cool things about the digital era is that we, it's so easy, it's much easier to share pictures than back when I was growing up and we had to share pictures using stone tablets and chisels. Um, and now we actually have pictures. I love that my students will send me pictures. When they send me a picture of a bird, I have a fighting chance. But when I'm looking at this two-dimensional kind of flat image of um, particularly of some herbaceous plants, it's very, very difficult. So I guess what I would say is if you've got people sending you pictures, ask them to get pictures of all the various parts, good, clear, in-focus pictures of all the different parts of the plant. And, um, but I, not everything can be identified with pictures, which is also my issue with some of the apps that we use because, um, you know, there's still a place for books and hand lenses. And we really, shouldn't we get beyond just 
posting pictures and having other people tell you what they are? Don't we want to get ambitious enough to try to start figuring them out for ourselves? And, and that's what I would encourage everybody to do is go deeper, um, you know, at least as deep as you're interested in going and try to tackle using one of these books and try to tackle using more than just the pictures. You will be surprised what you're capable of doing. And I see somebody posted, yeah, bring back a sample, but you know, that's, that's really what you often need is a decent sample rather than just a picture. Okay, next, foxtail grass is said to be hazardous to domestic animals, but I have had a hard time finding what genera of the many commonly called foxtails are the troublesome ones. Help, please. Well, I don't know whether everything is called foxtail is harmful. I definitely know that the foxtail barley is, and there may be somebody out there that can, can just, but most of y'all are far more knowledgeable than me, so please somebody comment with the best answer. But I do know foxtail barley can be bad news um, because you've got these, these awns that get swallowed and I think they are, they're, they're, they're kind of barbed and so they can lodge into the lining of the gut and really cause problems. It may be that some of the other things we call foxtails do that as well. But I think that's really the case with, um, with what we call um, foxtail barley. And, the, and there's, there's another thing, I think sometimes it's called rip gut. Um, so the scientific name is Hordium jubatum. And by the way, if, you know, if there's any interest in this list, I mean, I'm really repeating what the book does, except I'm just pointing out a subset of those that um, if these are the 25 things. If you get these figured out, it's going to really help you with the rest. If anybody's interested in this list, if we can find a way for me to get it to, you, it could be distributed easily. I'd be happy to share it with you all. It makes good bedtime reading. We may be able to put it in the recording. We can try. Okay. Um, Thanks, Charlie. <laughs> an audience member lives in Baltimore County near I-95 and the Baltimore Beltway and has been removing invasive grasses, vines, and plants from the edge of the woods behind their house. There's a shallow divot that remains wet when there's a lot of rain, and this person would like to plant some native grasses to replace the non-natives, especially in the wet area, which goes bone dry during drought. Do you have any recommendations? Oh so it's wet and then it's dry. Hmm. I think a lot of the, the wetland grasses that I think of as being, um, being adapted you know, for wetlands are not going to work there. I actually defer that answer to somebody um, that probably deals more with stuff in that regard than I do. And so if any of you all out there have a, a good answer for that, please share that with, with us. I'm not sure exactly what I would recommend. Um, you know, there's some species that are equally, that, that are specifically adapted to, to those kinds of conditions, but I'm, nothing is coming to mind at the moment. So if, if one of y'all has a better idea, please share it. Okay, next question is in general, what is the wildlife value of grasses? Specifically, is it mostly seeds for birds or small mammals or more along the line of shelter for small mammals or insects? And this person also wants to know, what is the wildlife value of planting grasses in their home's native plant garden compared to native perennials? Well, the answer to that is yes. Um, grasses provide food. I mean, some grasses, the, the, the seeds themselves, the fruits are eaten. Um, there are others that are just, that are, that are um, grazed upon by certain species of wildlife. You know, when we talk about wildlife, often people are thinking, I know my students tend to think of game species, but they're all sorts of wildlife. They're all sorts of insects and um, other invertebrates for which, for whom grasses are important. So they provide food. They provide cover and shelter, just as you mentioned. Um, they, they can serve to, to hold soil in place as well. And um, so, and, and native species are already adapted to those conditions. We all know the value of native species. Um, I'm not a gardener. I'm good at killing plants rather than um, growing plants. I just don't try to mess with it because it's just an insult to gardeners everywhere. But um, I think, you know, grasses are lovely just as themselves. And there are situations where just allowing grasses to grow is, is a, is, it's beautiful. But beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. Um, I, I love, I think some of our um, 
our, our, our meadows um, with, um, especially with these native grasses are gorgeous, but not everybody feels that way. But there are a lot of values. And, um, and there are things that there are species that grasses provide benefits for that um, probably we don't even know. So, um, <clears throat> you know, I think a variety of different things that they do for wildlife. Have you come across populations of the native bamboo switch cane, or is it only in Eastern Maryland? From my understanding, um, I mean, it's downstate. I know it, it, it is, or, and it certainly was, I think, more abundant um, on maybe the lower shore, maybe in Southern Maryland. I know it also used to occur um, and may still be remnant patches of it in Southern West Virginia. But I've never seen it there. I've actually seen it in the Ozarks and Missouri is where I've actually seen it. Um, but, you know, that's a, that's a plant that, um, that, that has been decimated in many areas, but had just, you know, provided unique habitat for a variety of species. And some of those species are far less common than they ever used to be before. But I don't know. Again, I think um, go to Maryland Biodiversity Project and look at their maps. Um, and I think, but I think it is greatly reduced. And again, I think they're probably folks in the audience that could give a much more informed response than I can. Before we go to the next question, I also wanted to mention for the questions about wildlife value, you might also want to view the recordings of our previous two webinars where the speakers uh, talked about that. Where, where the speakers actually knew what they were talking about. Yes. Um, another person asks, will we find most of these grasses in DC and Montgomery County? Um, many of them, I don't know. And again, I'm, you know, I have less familiarity uh, once I get to where it gets hot, because who wants to be hot in the summer and who doesn't want to, who wants to not be cold in the winter. Um, most of these are represented downstate, but, um, but there's, I think there are a few that aren't. I don't think blue joint gets down that far. I may be wrong about that. But especially, especially the non-natives that you can you can find there, and I would think that this list, um, that the ones I've covered, that many of them, if not all, um, you're still going to be able to find down there. So um, I, I still think this would have value. And and just to you know, when I developed this presentation, I was kind of thinking about doing it for about 15 really bored people at Frostburg, and I didn't think people from downstate would be interested in this. So. Um, there may be some things I've talked about that you would have more difficulty finding downstate. Someone asks, you didn't mention How to Know the Grasses by Richard Pohl. Do you not find that book useful? I don't know. I'm trying to think which, is that the, is that the spiral bound one? I'm trying to think which book that is. I, I, and I don't know. I mean, sure, it's very useful. It's just one that I have not necessarily um, taken advantage of. For me, um, the, the, the Lauren Brown book was great. And then my avenue then went to Agnes Chase and then using some of these technical keys. So it doesn't mean there aren't other that are useful. I just don't have, I just didn't end up messing with them. So I need to, somebody post that on there. I will check it out and I will get back with you. Many times, in wetlands, this person comes across mode areas and wonders how would you recommend getting started on identifying a mode grass <laughs> as vegetation can be a very important indicator. Yeah. Oh, that's, it's, that's, that's challenging, isn't it? I mean, because so for many of these grasses, you need the reproductive parts to, to recognize them. And, and what, what tends to happen is once you learn them based on the most distinctive features, then you notice other things that you can recognize, and then you can recognize them based on those other things. Um, but yeah, mowing makes it tough, right? So um, I think there's some things that you would be able to recognize based on leaves and based on uh, ligules, which is this little extra bit of tissue where the sheath leaves the, the, the or where the blade uh, leaves the stem. Um, but it's, yeah, I've, I have, in my class, I require my students to pick a plot that they monitor across the entire growing season. And they, they, they set up a survey, uh, kind of a sampling design, and they are supposed to record, identify and record every plant that they find. And every year, at least one of them, ends, it ends up being mown. And then they're just, you know, 
it's it's a makes life tough. So I'm not sure what to tell you. I think there's some things you can figure out, but um, it only makes things tough. So we shouldn't know. Um, a couple of participants have made suggestions about the wet area that goes dry. Mm -hmm. One is Alimus virginicus or similar. Okay. Uh, one, one of the wild rice. Says mm -hmm. surface. Cyperinus in the eastern coastal plain can grow in the water of seasonal ponds, but then do well when the pond dries out completely. Mm -hmm. um, another says switchgrass. Okay. Mm -hmm. Somebody saw that. Yeah. And um, we also, it looks like we will be able to post the files on our website. Okay. Um, any recommendations for telling uh, many of the dicamphelium species apart? I think you just wade in. I think if you, and again, if you use um, the, the, the grass sedges and rushes book now, and it will help you to recognize, I mean, this is a big group, but you can recognize some that are particularly distinctive, but then you just wade into the key. You're down to the genus, and just wade into the key, pay attention to where you are, because that's gonna be important in whether or not to expect a particular species there or not. But to me, this, this will sound weird. That's fascinating, that's fun to do that. But just try it, get out a ruler, get out your hand lens and, and pour through it and um, see what you can figure out. But I can't tell you, oh, you do this to identify this and this to identify this, to this to identify this. But, Get out there, get on your rear end, sit down amongst them, and give it a shot. And, um, you know, don't be afraid to try. Okay, I think that's all the questions. There's some more uh, book links in the chat. Um, I think that's it for the questions. Um, thank you so much, Kevin. And thanks, everyone, for your attention and your questions. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to share with you all. And um, it's very humbling to get your questions because I basically knew zero answers. So thank you for that. Oh, you answered them all, Kevin. Okay, thanks again very much. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye.